Good morning. Good morning. Grace to you and peace in the name of the God who creates and redeems and sustains us. Welcome to the First Presbyterian Church of Lansdowne. It's good to see everybody this morning. Uh, we've got a few announcements before we get started with worship. So if you're joining with us on Zoom this morning, we want to say welcome. And if you uh, have any prayer requests, please put those into the Zoom chat so that we can recognize those when we get to the prayers of the people today. Uh, our liturgist today is Harry Rickards. Directs Acosnet is doing Children's Church. Chris Bellis and Bill Costnet are running the AV desk. Annabelle Lyons and Bill are our counters today. And um, you want to do one? Uh, yeah, the, it's not a it's, it's discipleship. Yes. No, no, it's not discipleship. It's music and worship. Music and worship is doing coffee hour today. So thank you to everybody for making uh, the worship services run smoothly. Um, Palm Sunday is next Sunday. Um, this Easter season, or this Lent season, has seemed to gone really quickly for me. Um, so a couple of things are happening next week on Palm Sunday. After worship is the Palm Sunday brunch. Um, 
I am told there are still plenty of spaces on the Sign Up Genius to um, sign up to bring different dishes and things like that. That is um, on the Chimes newsletter is the Sign Up Genius for that. A um, Couple other things. Um, we're also encouraging folks to bring, quote, cans and cash for the food cupboard. So instead of bringing palms that day, we will bring, um, we'll bring cans and uh, donations to the food cupboard to continue that ministry. Um, that donation will be in Irwin Hall uh, during the, the brunch. Make sure to get here early next Sunday, at least a few minutes, because uh, we're going to gather here as long as the weather is nice. Um, we're going to gather on the front lawn and then process into the sanctuary for Palm Sunday with our palms and all that good fun stuff. Um, so be here by 9.55. Um, and then we'll, we're going to take our uh, hopefully annual congregational photo at that point um, from the bell tower and then we'll process in. Um, so be here a few minutes early as best you can and we'll do that. Also, uh, the Peeps Diorama Contest will be taking place during the uh, brunch. So if you're not familiar with what that is, Peeps, the little marshmallow rabbit things. Um, make your best biblical scene, and everybody will uh, vote during uh, the Palm Sunday brunch. Uh, and it's a fun time. It's, 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 it's good to see what everybody comes up with uh, and see everybody's creative uh, minds come out. So all that is next Sunday. Um, we will not have Bible study next Sunday or, or Easter Sunday. Um, we figured those days are busy enough. Um, so we won't have Bible study those Sundays. Um, we, will, we won't have Bible study on Thursday evening as well, um, the week of Holy Week, because that's going to be our Monday Thursday service. Um, so come here for that. That service is going to be at 7 p.m. on Monday, Thursday. The food cupboard is requesting uh, pasta and tomato sauce for the month of March. Uh, so please, if you have donations for that, you can put those in the, um, the donation bin in the vestibule to Westminster Hall. The chancel flowers today are given in loving memory of Paulette Canuso by Lori Jordan. Um, so we give thanks for those. And Easter flower order forms are due before Friday. So if you would like to order that, Lois, Hattie, Ryda, and Cheryl all have order forms, as well as there are some in the narthex here in the sanctuary. If you were thinking about sending your kid to summer camp, uh, to Johnsonburg summer camp, now is the time to start thinking about that. Harry has a brochure that they've sent us if you want some information about that. Um, and we may also have some financial aid, financial aid available for that if you would like to um, send somebody to summer camp this week or this summer. If you were worshiping with us this morning for the first time, um, thank you for being here. We are excited to see you. Uh, welcome to the Presbyterian Church. Um, if you see an unfamiliar face, please be sure to introduce yourselves. And Betsy just reminded me of one more announcement. For Easter Sunday, after worship, um, we will have the Easter egg hunt. In preparation for the Easter egg hunt, um, we usually uh, put together some um, bags of eggs for folks to take home and fill up and then bring those back uh, for, for us to put out on that Sunday. So today, um, we're going to have those today and next Sunday. I think Bessie's going to give them to Harry today. Um, so, let me know about that. Okay. Uh, and then next Sunday, we'll have those as well for folks to take home. And so we'll have tons of eggs for the kids to run around and find. I think those are all of the announcements. Let us begin with worship. Why are you here? I see it. You're in the right place. This is God's house. The door is open to you. Why are you here? I am seeking God with my whole heart, with my entire mind, 
with a fire burning in my bones. Let us worship God. Our gathering prayer. Almighty God, our Redeemer, in our weakness we have failed to be your messengers of forgiveness and hope. Renew us by your Holy Spirit that we may follow your commands and proclaim your reign of love through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first hymn is found in the insert of your bulletin, Teach Me Thy Way, O Lord. When you study Peter's story in Scripture, it is almost impossible to ignore how much he loved to ask questions. He asked Jesus, what does this parable mean? Where are you going? How many times should we forgive? Like a tenacious toddler, Peter was full of questions because Peter was eager to learn. I wish I was more like that. I still have so much to learn. So friends, let us be like Peter. Let us return to Christ with humility, with the humility of a student. As we pray together our prayer of confession, let this be a moment of learning. Let us pray. Holy God, we long to be lifelong learners. We long to approach you with curiosity and an open mind. Instead, we often live as if we know best. We forget that the disciples called you rabbi, 
Teacher, forgive us for the times when we fail to be curious. Forgive us for the times when we assume we know best. Forgive us for the moments when we imagine that our learning is done and that we have all the answers. Like Peter, who was brave enough to ask, how many times should we forgive? Make us brave. Spark a desire in us to learn. And may our curiosity carry our faith into deeper waters. With hope and humility, we pray. Amen. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Family of faith, when Peter asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive? Jesus responded with abundance. That abundance exists for us as well. No matter what you have done or left undone, no matter what lessons you have learned or are still learning, God's abundant grace exists for each of us. God's love will never run out. So hear and rest in this good news. You are forgiven, you are loved, and you are invited to serve. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Teaching God, we want to learn your ways. We want to learn the ways of forgiveness. We want to learn the ways of grace. We want to learn your ways of love. That is part of why we return to your text week after week, because we are hungry to be more like you. As we prepare to listen to your good word, Calm the noise in our minds. Center our spirits to focus on you so that we might learn and hear what we have missed in this story before. God, we want to learn your ways. Meet us here. Speak your truth. Help us to listen. Amen. Our first scripture reading is taken from Psalm 19, verses 19 through 16. How can young people keep their way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Do not let me stray from your commands. I treasure your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the ordinances of your mouth. I delight in the way of your decrees as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word, the word of the Lord.
the kids come up for our youth chat. Come on down. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Come on up, guys. Good morning. How are you? Good. Good. How's everybody doing this morning? Good, good. Thanks for coming up today. All right. So if I say the word forgiveness, what do you guys think of? What does that mean to you? Yeah, you're going to first. Yeah. What's that? Being faithful? Thankful. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, Ruthie. When somebody does something wrong, you shouldn't do it back. Absolutely. Yeah. Not revenge, right? Yeah. Any others? So when, so in our scripture passage for today, Jesus is giving his disciples some instructions for how to forgive people, how often they should do it. And Peter, the disciple, comes up and says, well, how often should I forgive people? If they, if they uh, do something bad against me seven times, should I forgive them seven times? And Jesus says, do you guys know what he says? Yeah, so he says something like, not just seven times. Don't just forgive him seven times. Give him either 77 times or seven times, 70 times. So a lot of times, right? Has anybody counted how many times you've forgiven somebody? Anybody ever reached something close to 490 times? No, right? Because it's impractical, right? It doesn't make sense. Like, if you're going to forgive somebody four or nine times, you might as well just forgive them all the time, right? And that's what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about forgiveness as something that we do with everybody, right? Because if we don't forgive people, are we perfect? Are you perfect? Have you ever done something wrong? Yeah? I've done lots of wrong things, and I hope that people forgive me and that I learn about what I did wrong, right? So that I don't do it again, and so that we can all be a better community, right? Because that's what forgiveness does. It helps us build community, and it helps us make better friends. It helps us make better brothers and sisters and daughters and sons and all sorts of good things. So, is that a hand up? No, okay. So, 
I just want you to remember, as you go forward, when somebody says, or when somebody's done something wrong to you, we're supposed to forgive them. But we're also supposed to try to make them better, right? Because that makes us better. If we can help somebody figure out where things went wrong, then we're all going to do things a little bit better. Will you guys say a prayer with me? Okay. Dear Lord, Dear Lord thank you, thank you for, helping us for helping us learn how to forgive. Learn how to forgive. We, need this help we need this help because it can be hard. So thank you. So thank you. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, before y'all go anywhere, we have a little bit of a, something extra this morning. So some of you may know that today we have three birthdays in the house. We have Miss Margaret and Mr. Howard and Miss Ellie all have birthdays today. So last week, Miss Ruthie asked me if she could do something special for us. So she is going to come up, and let's have you come stand right here. So if we come over here for a little bit. And Ruthie is going to play something for us, okay? Come stand right here in the middle. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Ruthie, Margaret, Howard, Ellie. Happy birthday today. I hear that there is going to be cake in uh, coffee hour afterwards. So, all right. Thanks, everybody. If you guys want to go to Children's Church, you can go with Miss Derexa and Miss Amanda. Thank you. Okay, so good morning again. Hi. Happy birthday, Ellie. Happy birthday, Howard. Happy birthday, Margaret. I think that's probably the best rendition we have seen in this sanctuary in quite some time. <laughs> we are continuing our uh, journey alongside the Apostle Peter this Lenten season. Up to this point, uh, Peter has been seen in various places. He's been called by Jesus from a boat. He's walked on water and then subsequently almost drowned in the water. He's correctly identified Jesus as the Messiah. And then almost in the next breath, he has been called Hasatan, the Satan, get behind me, Satan, for tempting Jesus. So he's had uh, a bit of a roller coaster ride, let's say, so far in the Gospels. Uh, but he continues to follow in Jesus' footsteps, continues to try to learn what it means to become a disciple of Jesus and one who works towards living out the kingdom as Jesus wants it to be. Today, we will see Peter continue along this journey. In this text, Jesus is teaching the disciples about how to be in community with, one each, with, with each other. So let us listen now for the word of the Lord. This is Matthew 18, 15 through 22. Jesus said, If another member of the church sins against you, go out and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of the two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. 
Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two or three of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by your Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If listening to this passage sounds familiar to you, good job. That means you remember what your pastor preached about for more than just a few days. We last looked at this passage back in September as the lectionary took us through the Gospel of Matthew. And you may remember that we spent some time during that sermon talking about how this first part of the passage, how the, you know, taking, talking to somebody, bringing two or three with you, taking them to the church, that whole piece was probably not something that Jesus ever actually said, but was, in fact, a snapshot into how the early church dealt with conflict and community building. We talked about how one of the reasons for this was because that first part of the passage, it talks about bringing someone in front of the church, the ecclesia, the assembly. And it denotes it in a way as a gathering of Jesus followers. Now, that might make sense to us as church members 2,000 years later who have an established institution that we call the church, but that probably would not have made sense to Jesus or to Peter or the disciples because the church, as we know it today, and as the passage refers to it, did not yet exist. Makes sense. So what most biblical scholars think we're looking at is how the early church started to deal with interpersonal conflict within the community. We also see a version of this text in Luke's Gospel. It's much shorter there, so short that I can read it for us, it won't take very long. Luke 17 verses 3 through 4 says, Be on guard. If your brother sins, you must rebuke the offender. And if there is repentance, you must forgive. And if the same person stands against you seven times a day and turns back to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive. That's it. In two verses, more or less, Jesus gets across approximately the same message as Matthew has turned into seven verses. Basically, if someone has wronged you, if they genuinely repent, you are supposed to forgive them, full stop. It doesn't matter how many times you have forgiven them in the past, you are to continue forgiving them. Matthew draws that out a little bit farther, adds a little bit more meat to the bones of the Luke story. It goes there from a general practice about forgiveness into a practice about how we forgive somebody specifically within the church community. And those are not necessarily the same thing. Luke's Jesus says that this is about a general living practice. Matthew's Jesus says this is about the church community. If I had to guess which one has a better chance of going back to the historical Jesus, I'd say it's probably the former. Jesus was so much more concerned with how we lived our lives in their entirety. Our church community should be a reflection of that, but we don't treat people better or differently just because we worship with them on a Sunday morning. We're to treat people with love and kindness and forgiveness no matter what. But then Peter comes in. And as he's thinking about this, he seems to have what might be a legitimate question. He asked Jesus how many times we should forgive. 
When do we draw the line? And to be honest, I think he has a point. Certainly, it seems like there should be a limit. It seems like there should be a point at which you understand that the wrong that has happened to you or to your community just keeps happening over and over again. And if that person is not actually willing to make a change to stop doing something, you're just going in circles. So what are we to do? If we take these verses as a whole, I think it's important to remember then that this section, these discussions on forgiveness are contextual. There is one way in which a community of people trying to figure out how to live with each other approached forgiveness. So it is necessarily then a potential framework, one probably of many, for interactions about indiscretions on individual or smaller scale. And I would argue that that is the approach that's being presented here. This is one-on-one small interactions between individual people. And that this is probably not going to be the best approach when dealing with larger systemic sins, right? If you think about it, if we're talking about the sin of systemic poverty or entrenched racism or militarism in the military-industrial complex, who are you going to go to? Is there an individual person that if you talk to in private, it's going to fix this? No. These are sins at a level beyond the control of a single individual. Having one person repent for something that they've done to contribute to the sins, to these larger systemic sins, is a step towards reconciliation and justice, but it is not the fulfillment of either of those. In fact, we see in other places Jesus taking other methods towards that achievement of justice and reconciliation during his life. Overturning the tables in the temple is a move towards justice. Riding into town on a donkey instead of a war horse is a move towards justice. Even being crucified to show the world what they have wrought is an act towards justice. So this method here that's being presented is one particular way, but it is not necessarily the only way. And there's a further limit to this passage as well. We say that we should constantly forgive, which is true, but oftentimes this passage and similar passages have been used as a way to keep people in abusive or harmful relationships. Unfortunately, there is a long history of ministers and the church uh, telling spouses that they should stay with their abusive partners and that they should just forgive them and hope that things change. But it is possible to both forgive someone for their actions that they have done in the past and not keep yourself in that abusive or harmful or dangerous situation. You can forgive someone after separation. Amen? In fact, at the end of this first part of this passage, Jesus says that these people that you've forgiven, or if they haven't, if they haven't repented, that they should be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. Now, our first instinct is to say that they then become anathema because of the reputation of tax collectors and Gentiles that we sort of know about. But if you look at how Jesus treats those tax collectors, you see that he eats dinner with people like Zacchaeus and calls them to a higher ethical standard. He doesn't just disregard them. And then we see at the end of Matthew's Gospel, we have the Great Commission that tells us to go out and to baptize all nations, the same word used in this passage for Gentile, their ethnicos, nations, comes from the same root, 
to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. These people are not anathema. You're just sort of supposed to start your relationship over with them in some ways. So there are some situations in which this text is limited, but there are ways in which it is still useful. A colleague of mine and I were talking about this passage this week, uh, and she said something that I thought was quite familiar, a way that she's been taught to understand this constant state of forgiveness. She says perhaps a better way to think about this passage is, for instance, something has been done to you in the past, something that you need to forgive someone for, and you feel like you've done that. You feel like you've done the work to move towards forgiveness. You feel like you've forgiven them and that perhaps you've just sort of moved on. But then something happens that triggers that trauma or that hurt or those emotions again. Those feelings come back up. It's at that point that we then have to re-forgive that person or those people again. Perhaps the feeling of being harmed by them again, even though it was just that one action, we have to forgive them again. Perhaps that is what Jesus is talking about here with Peter. This consistent and repeated kind of forgiveness needed in community. Maybe every time Jesus sees Peter, he thinks about that time when Peter tried to tempt him to not go through with his plan of going to Jerusalem to confront the leaders there. Every time, maybe Jesus is tempted again. So Jesus has to continue to forgive Peter over and over and over again. Like Peter, it's good for us to be reminded that forgiveness is an ongoing action and not a once and for all kind of thing. That it is a disposition and an outlook on life that calls us to be better people and calls us to live perhaps with a kind of grace and softness that the world could use more of. Friends, if we continue this Lenten journey in that way, let us find more ways to forgive, in healthy ways, for sure, knowing that forgiveness is the first step along the journey towards reconciliation and justice and a better world. In the name of the God who creates and redeems and sustains us. Amen.
please join me in our affirmation of faith. We believe that questions are a building block of faith. How many times should I pray? Jesus, where are you going? What must I do to inherit eternal life? We believe that humble curiosity can open our eyes. We believe God is a teacher. Speaking, Lord, your servant is listening. Here I am, send me. We believe that faith invites our whole being to engage. With all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our strength. We believe. Help our unbelief. Please be seated. Friends, we come now to our time of joys and concerns. Do we have anything from Zoom this morning? Nothing? Okay. Friends, what joys and concerns do we have today? Let's see Dave in the back. I just want to say, oh, hello? Yep. I just want to say happy birthday to my mom. I'm so grateful for everything that she does, not only for us, for me and my sister, church. So I just want to say happy birthday to you, mom. Yeah. Amen. God in your mercy. Yeah. Our prayer. Prayers to the family of my wife's brother my brother-in-law who lost their daughter, Mary Gail, to breast cancer at the age of 42. She passed last Wednesday. Uh, she was a very, very budding uh, marine biologist and had her whole life in front of her. So we praise that, that she is now with the Lord. God in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Lois's hand up. I have prayers for my brother who was just diagnosed with cancer. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Got Dory up front here. Dory, front row. Prayers for Haiti while we're on our way up to the front. Prayers for a friend, uh, Nick, who's um, losing his battle with lymphoma. Um, he's in hospice. And prayers for my nephew and a friend who is, um, has fallen down the basement steps and is really sore. Uh, <laughs> needs all kinds of prayers there. God, in your mercy. Um, just an update on our friend, Brenna. She's been recovering at home, and she's doing better, but she faces a new surgery this week, and they're really doing facial reconstruction. She's 19 years old. So prayers for Brenna, please. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Friends, let us go to God in prayer this morning. O oh God, we come before you, the one who holds our life and even our death, and pray for the transformation that Jesus Christ has shown us is possible. O oh God of the cross, the grave, and the empty tomb, we lift up to you all within us, that is in the messy process of death and resurrection. Transform us, we pray, into the likeness of your Son, that you might use us to bear much fruit in the world. 
May we die to environmental extraction and live to responsible stewardship. May we die to Christian triumphalism and live into interfaith humility. May we die to stagnation and aversion to change and live to the new things that God is always doing among us. May we die to American exceptionalism and live as global citizens. May we die to isolation and live to our shared humanity. May we die to division and partisanship and live to reconciliation and compassion. May we die to addictions and consumerism and live to our shared well-being. May we die to me and mine and live to us and ours. O God, who is always bringing new life out of death and despair, we pray for all those who need your healing hand this morning, for those we have lifted up, for conflicts around the world, for the genocide in Gaza, for the hungry and the homeless, those sick and in prison, for all people living in fear and loneliness or grief. O oh God, answer the longing of your people with the gift of your presence. All this we pray in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's the time for the invitation to the offering. And I would remind you that this is a privilege that we have to show gratitude for the abundance that we have received from our Lord. By the grace of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, our lives have borne much fruit. Let us now return thanks where it is due and offer the fruits of our labor back to the Lord. Let us receive the morning offering.
our prayer of dedication. Gracious God, it is our joy to return the gifts of our lives to you. May our offering this morning forever bring glory to your name. And may we continue to work tirelessly for the well-being of your whole creation. Amen. Our final hymn is number 399, We Walk by Faith and Not by Sight. our Lenten benediction. Beloved wander, as you leave this place, may you carry your curious heart on your sleeve. May you look for God in every face. May you find the courage to get out of the boat, to run to the tomb, and to speak of your faith. And when the world falls apart, may you hear God's voice deep within, saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. You are called, you are blessed, in both your ups and your downs, you always belong to God. So go now in peace, trusting in that good news. Amen.